Good morning, everyone. It's nine o'clock, so we will uh, go ahead and begin. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful, Grant us in that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of the Rosary, pray, pray for us. St. Gerard and Joe, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, welcome if you weren't with us last week. Great to have you. Welcome back if you were brave enough to return. <laughs> Um, I wanted to begin with a little quote from a homily that St. John Paul II gave. I've been uh, actually kind of, in my uh, spiritual reading, going back through his homilies. It's great the Vatican website has all of the homilies from all the popes, so you can go back. And so I've been kind of been gradually working my way through his homilies. And this is just a little quote of his during his first visit back to Poland after he was elected pope in 1979. And he said to the Polish people, the Pope who visits you expects from you a generous and noble effort to know the Church better and better. The Second Vatican Council wished to be above all a council on the Church. Take in your hands the documents of the Council. You've got them in your hands. Isn't that wonderful? He says, especially Lumen Gentium. We'll get to that eventually. Study them with loving intent attention, with the spirit of prayer, to discover what the Spirit wished to say about the Church. In this way, you will be able to realize that there is not, as some people claim, a new church, different or opposed to the old church, but that the council wished to reveal more clearly the one church of Jesus Christ with new aspects, but still the same in its essence. So there you have kind of some of the, those things you were talking about last time, this idea of a continuity uh, that the council was desiring to bring to bear in the modern world, uh, what the church has always believed and taught. And so as we venture into the, this document during this uh, series, uh, we're, we're heeding the words of this great saint, St. John Paul II, taking up these documents in order to study the church. So uh, there's a lot here, and particularly in this um, second session here, it's a large section of, of the document. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to <coughs> touch on key points or maybe particular items that seems to me may need some clarification for you. Uh, but we're not going to be able to go through every detail of the document. But as we go, please feel free to raise questions if, as you were reading before you came or as we're going through. If things strike and you have questions, just ask them uh, in the middle. Raise your hand and we'll just pause and, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. So again, there's a lot in this one section. We're going to try and stay within an hour's time and uh, work our way through the key points here. And, uh, We'll see how we do. So, I want to begin at uh, paragraph two. So, I'll use the paragraph numbers as references to help you follow along here as we go. And um, I, well, I was going to ask for a volunteer to read. I wonder if the camera will pick that up. Maybe I should just read. That'd be bad. All right. <laughs> You're going to get tired of my voice by the end. So, I'm going to read right at the start of paragraph two. For the liturgy through which the work of our redemption is accomplished, most of all in the divine sacrifice of the Eucharist, is the outstanding means whereby the faithful may express in their lives and manifest to others the mystery of Christ and the real nature of the Church. So a few points here. First of all, we should probably define the word liturgy, right? This whole document is about the liturgy. Uh, the Church calls the liturgy all of the official public worship of the church. So the Mass is the most obvious and most familiar example of the church's liturgy to us, and much of this document is going to speak about the Mass. But the liturgy is bigger than that. The liturgy includes all of these sacraments, so each sacrament has a particular form and structure, a rite, that goes along with it, and so that's part of the church's liturgy. Uh, the liturgy of the hours is part of the church's liturgy, the formal official prayer, daily prayer of the church, praying the psalms uh, outside of the Mass, and also the church's official blessings. So we have a book of blessings that 
uh, are used to bless objects and people and, and occasions and whatnot. All of these things together make up the church's liturgy. And as we'll see later, this is distinguished from the private prayers and devotions of the Christian people. Um, all of which is important in our spiritual life. Uh, but the, the liturgy is the official prayer of the church. Okay, so that's what we mean by the word liturgy. Also, uh, in this paragraph, I was struck by the, the little quote in that very first line when it said the liturgy through which the work of our redemption is accomplished. That may strike us as somewhat strange because it would seem as if the work of our redemption was accomplished on the cross and in the resurrection 2,000 years ago. So why do we say that in the liturgy, the work of our redemption is accomplished. It's precisely because we believe that what the liturgy does is makes present in this time and this place the fruits of Jesus' death and resurrection. So when we go to Mass, we believe that his death and resurrection is made truly present for us. And the work of our redemption is accomplished because that's how what he won for us on the cross is applied to individual souls throughout history. It happens through the church's liturgy. So that's why we say it's through the liturgy that the work of his redemption, our redemption, is accomplished. Also, I don't know if you, uh, this is just kind of an interesting side note, but if you look at the footnote for that little quote, it tells you it's from the secret of the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. So, the secret, that may seem like a strange term to us. That's actually what the what we would call the prayer over the gifts, which is the prayer the priest prays over the gifts right before the preface. So after the bread and wine had been placed on the altar and offered, the prayer over the gifts used to be called the secret, and it was called that because before the reforms of Vatican II, that prayer was played quietly by the priest in a whisper. So it was kind of secret, because you didn't hear it. Now it wasn't it wasn't secret in that it wasn't public. There were missiles so that had the prayer in it, so you could have found the prayer. But they called it the secret because it was it was whispered quietly by the priests. Okay, let's jump down to uh, paragraph three, and there I'm going to go to the second paragraph under the number three. It says among these principles and norms. So the principles and norms that are about to be laid out in this document. There are some which can and should be applied both to the Roman rite and also to all the other rites. So that's a key distinction in the church. Uh, you may be, many of you may be familiar with this, but we belong to the Roman rite, or sometimes we say the Latin rite of the Catholic Church. But we are not the only rite in the Catholic Church. Uh, there are numerous other rites which we typically call the Eastern rites that just historically have kind of grown up along with the Roman Rite and have their own unique uh, liturgical kind of emphases and languages and customs. They're just as much Catholic as we are, uh, but their liturgy looks rather different. So here in St. Louis, for example, we have a large Maronite population. The Maronites are Catholics of a different Rite. Uh, so if you go down to St. Raymond's Cathedral, downtown or now St. Elizabeth of Hungary, is also a Maronite parish. Um, it wouldn't look quite exactly like the Mass we're familiar with, but it is Catholic liturgy. And you can participate and receive Holy Communion and fulfill your Sunday obligation, if we had a Sunday obligation, which we don't right now, by going there. So that's what's meant by the, the different rites. And so there's some things in here that apply across the board, but there are some things that are unique to the Roman rite that the fathers of the Second Vatican Council wanted to show that respect for the, the dignity and equality of the other rites of the church. How about this church over here that's Russian or something? Uh, that's an Orthodox church, so they would not be in communion with the Catholic Church. Oh, okay. They would have split in the um, Great Schism of 1054, so almost a thousand years ago now. Um, so, but they still operate kind of the same way, don't they? Yeah, the Orthodox have preserved um, much of much of the same uh, faith and tradition that we have. Um, the, the biggest difference is that they do not acknowledge the uh, primacy of the Pope as the supreme pontiff of the whole Catholic Church, whereas the Eastern Catholic Churches would. They're all subject to the Pope. Okay, so I just want to make sure we understand that distinction in the rites. 
Let's flip over. So that was just that was the introduction, kind of just a very quick laying of the groundwork for what lies ahead. The rest of today we're going to look at chapter one, which is titled General Principles for the Restoration and Promotion of the Sacred Liturgy. Okay, so this is going to be divided into sections. And what the document here is doing is it's going to very um, precisely lay out these what principles we're following for the reforms that are then going to be proposed throughout the rest of the document. So after this, we're going to look at the, the Mass and the other sacraments and the Divine Office and the liturgical year. We're going to apply these principles to all these aspects of the Church's liturgy. But here we're going to get kind of a general uh, laying out of those principles. And we're going to spend a lot of time today in the first section of chapter 1, which is titled The Nature of the Sacred Liturgy and Its Importance in the Church's Life. Because this is really the Church's laying out um, what we believe about the liturgy and why it's important for us. So this, before even any of these other practical reforms, is, is really significant and important for us. And it's, if you read it, I hope you found it beautiful. You could pray with it, I think, and kind of use it as spiritual reading as you reflect upon the gift of the liturgy. So we're going to read this section pretty much in its entirety, and I'll comment um, as we go on some of the various points here. Okay, so again, the first section is titled The Nature of the Sacred Liturgy and Its Importance in the Church's Life. So paragraph five, God who wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, who in many and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, when the fullness of time had come, sent his Son, the Word made flesh, anointed by the Holy Spirit, to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the contrite of heart, to be a bodily and spiritual medicine, the mediator between God and man. For his humanity, united with the person of the Word, was the instrument of our salvation. Therefore, in Christ, the perfect achievement of our reconciliation came forth, and the fullness of divine worship was given to us. So what the document here is doing is going to situate the liturgy within what we call the economy of salvation. The economy of salvation just refers to God's overarching plan throughout the whole of history for the salvation of the world. Okay? So that's why it begins by a reference to God, the Father, who wills that all men be saved. And so how does God accomplish this? Well, in the Old Testament, he spoke through the fathers and the prophets. And then in the fullness of time, the Son, Jesus Christ, comes among us as the Word made flesh, who is anointed by the Holy Spirit. So at the very get-go, we have the Trinity, right? God the Father, who spoke through the fathers and the prophets, sent his Son, who was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we begin, everything flows from the fundamental truth of our faith about God, the Trinity. And Jesus Christ is the perfect achievement of our reconciliation and the fullness of divine worship. So we often refer to Jesus as the, the fullness of God's revelation. That after the coming of Christ, God has fully, if you will, bared his heart to us. He's revealed himself completely. And so because Jesus is the fullness of divine revelation, he is also the fullness of divine worship. He teaches us perfect worship of God. Which, by the way, is why the way that they worshipped in the Old Testament was fulfilled by Christ. And so the, the sacrifices of old ended because it was all fulfilled in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, which now is perpetuated in our liturgy. Okay, we'll keep reading. The wonderful works of God among the people of the Old Testament were but a prelude to the work of Christ to the Lord in redeeming mankind and giving perfect glory to God. He achieved his task principally by the paschal mystery of his blessed passion, resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension, whereby dying he destroyed our death, and rising he restored our life. So the heart of Jesus' life is the paschal mystery, the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. This, above all, is how he accomplished our redemption. And it goes on, For it was from the side of Christ as he slept the sleep of death upon the cross, 
that there came forth the wondrous sacrament of the whole church. So this is how the economy of salvation flows. From the heart of the Trinity, the Son becomes incarnate, he saves us by his paschal mystery, and then he gives us the church to perpetuate this salvation in every time and place. And this beautiful language that it's from his side as he slept on the cross that the church is born. If you know scripture, this is spousal language because it was from the side of Adam as he slept that Eve was born. So the church here is being presented as the bride of Christ, born from his side on the cross. And there's a really uh, beautiful way to think about the liturgy in these spousal terms, um, which is if the church is the bride, all of human history is as if the bride is walking down the aisle towards her bridegroom at the end of time. So all of history is the church, the bride, processing, if you will, towards the divine bridegroom, which will be, that union will be perfected then in heaven. And interestingly, by the way, this is one of the reasons that uh, for many, many centuries, the liturgy was celebrated facing the east where the priest and the people together would face towards the east because it was believed that Christ would come again from the east. So it was the bride facing and processing down the aisle towards the bridegroom who was going to come again from the east. So really beautiful uh, imagery here in this spousal imagery. Paragraph 6. So this is going to be all now about the mission of the church. Just as Christ was sent by the Father, so also he sent the apostles, filled with the Holy Spirit. This he did that by preaching the gospel to every creature, they might proclaim that the Son of God, by his death and resurrection, had freed us from the power of Satan and from death, and brought us into the kingdom of his Father. His purpose also was that they might accomplish the work of salvation which they had proclaimed, by means of sacrifice and sacraments around which the entire liturgical life revolves. So here again, the, the salvation of the world is being accomplished through the liturgy. So the apostles are sent to proclaim the truth in order to draw people essentially to the liturgy, which is the, the source of grace and salvation throughout history. So this is why the Catholic Church, from her very beginning into our own day, is not just a church of the Word, but the Word is meant to lead us to the sacrament, which is where the grace of Christ is given to us, applied to the individual soul. Thus, by baptism, men are plunged into the paschal mystery of Christ. Plunged. Baptism. Right, into the water. We're plunged into the mystery. They die with him, are buried with him, and rise with him. They receive the spirit of adoption as sons, in which we cry, Abba, Father, and thus become true adorers whom the Father seeks. In like manner, so often as they eat the supper of the Lord, they proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. For that reason, on the very day of Pentecost, when the church appeared before the world, those who received the word of Peter were baptized. And they continued steadfastly in the teaching of the apostles and in the communion of the breaking of bread and in prayers, praising God and being in favor with all the people. The breaking of the bread in the Acts of the Apostles is a reference to the Mass from the very beginning of the church. From that time onwards, the church has never failed to come together to celebrate the Paschal Mystery, reading those things which were in all the scriptures concerning him, celebrating the Eucharist, in which the victory and triumph of his death are again made present, and at the same time giving thanks to God for his unspeakable gift in Christ Jesus, in praise of his glory through the power of the Holy Spirit. So there you have kind of the overarching economy of salvation. From the Trinity, the Incarnation, salvation and the Paschal Mystery, then proclaimed and effected throughout time by the Apostles and their successors and the Church all throughout the generations to our own day. Now paragraph 7 is going to speak about how Christ remains present 
to his church throughout history. And it's going to speak of a number of different modes, if you will, of Christ's presence, his continuing presence among us. To accomplish so great a work, Christ is always present in his church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. He is present in the sacrifice of the Mass, not only in the person of his minister, so in the priest, Christ is present, the same now offering through the ministry of priests who formerly offered himself on the cross, especially under the Eucharistic species. By his power, he is present in the sacraments, so that when a man baptizes, it is really Christ himself who baptizes. He is present in his word, since it is he himself who speaks when the Holy Scriptures are read in the church. He is present, lastly, when the church prays and sings, for he promised where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So we have five different modes of Christ's presence in the liturgy. In the minister, in the Eucharistic species, in the sacraments, in his word, and in the community of the church praying and singing together. It's interesting, however, every word is carefully considered here by the bishops that when they speak about the Eucharist, they say especially, especially under the Eucharistic species. They're indicating here that these are all modes, truly, of Christ's presence among us, um, but the Eucharist is unique because it is the true, substantial presence of Jesus Christ in our midst. So they, they use this word especially to indicate um, this truth, that there's a uniqueness of, to the Eucharist. Also, it's interesting, they, they say when a man baptizes, it is really Christ himself who baptizes. I don't know how many of you have seen this in the Catholic uh, media recently, but there have been a couple priests recently who discovered that their baptism was invalid, which meant that their confirmation was invalid, their ordination as a priest was invalid, and the reason their baptism was invalid is because the minister of the sacrament said not, I baptize you, but we baptize you. And it may seem like we're just are bickering over what's one word, right? The I is significant because it's not the community that baptizes, it's Christ. I baptize. And the minister who baptizes, it's really Christ who baptizes through the minister. So a little kind of connection to something that's been in the news recently. The next little section here is going to speak about the two primary ends or goals or purposes of the liturgy. Christ indeed always associates the church with himself in this great work, wherein God is perfectly glorified and men are sanctified. The glory of God and the salvation, the sanctification of humankind. These are the two ends of the liturgy. This is what the liturgy is all about. The glory of God and our sanctification. That's the ultimate goal, the purpose. The church is his beloved bride who calls to her Lord and through him offers worship to the Eternal Father. So again, that spousal language. Rightly then, the liturgy is considered as an exercise of the priestly office of Jesus Christ. Uh, you may remember from your study of the faith that Jesus, we believe, held three offices. He was priest, prophet, and king. And the liturgy is primarily the exercise of his priestly office. The priest is a bridge, a mediator between God and man, and the priest is one who offers sacrifice. So it's in the liturgy, above all, that Jesus does this. And we all participate in the priestly office of Jesus Christ by virtue of our baptism. All of the baptized share, we say, in the common priesthood of Jesus Christ. So when we go to Mass, we are meant to be offering with Jesus our lives as a sacrifice to the Father. And then the priest, the ordained priest, exercises the ordained priesthood, unique and distinct from the baptized priesthood, in the very person of Christ, uniting all of the offerings of the people in the perfect sacrifice of Christ offered to the Father. So it's the priestly office of Jesus Christ being exercised by priests and people all together uh, around the altar of the Lord.
Okay, uh, I'm going to jump down just to that next little section just above paragraph number eight. From this it follows that every liturgical celebration, because it is an action of Christ the priest and of his body, which is the church, is a sacred action surpassing all others. No other action of the church can equal its efficacy by the same title and to the same degree. So there are all kinds of things that the church does, right? <laughs> We preach and we teach and we perform acts of charity for the sick and the poor. All of these are good things, right? It's part of the church's life. But none of these surpasses the ultimate dignity and value of the liturgy. And we're going to come in a little bit to that phrase that we're probably familiar with, that the liturgy is the source and summit of the whole Christian life. Everything else the church does is meant to flow into and out of our worship of God in the liturgy. It's the point that's being made here. Paragraph 8, in the earthly liturgy, we take part in a foretaste of that heavenly liturgy, which is celebrated in the holy city of Jerusalem, toward which we journey as pilgrims. So here, this is a, an eschatological teaching about the liturgy. Eschatology refers to the study of the end of the world, the fulfillment of all things. And so here we have this idea that we are pilgrims journeying to that ultimate destination of our pilgrimage, which is the kingdom of heaven. This is what's happening in the liturgy. And already in our divine worship of God on earth, we have a foretaste of that perfect eternal liturgy of heaven. Above all, in the reception of Holy Communion, we have that foretaste. But our whole participation in the liturgy is already here and now a kind of foretaste of what is to come. That's why practicing Catholics go to Mass. We're practicing for heaven when we go to Mass by worshiping God. Skip down to number nine. The sacred liturgy does not exhaust the entire activity of the church. Before men can come to the liturgy, they must be called to faith and to conversion. How then are they to call upon him in whom they have not yet believed? But how are they to believe him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear if no one preaches? And how are men to preach unless they are they be sent? It's a quote from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. So here we come back to this idea that the liturgy is the most important work of the church, but it's not the only work of the church. And in fact, certain things have to precede in time the liturgy which is this, this preaching, evangelization, right? If we're going to have people at Mass to offer their worship to God, they have to believe. And if they're going to believe, someone has to preach to them. And if someone's going to preach to them, that person has to be sent. So Jesus, at the Ascension, what does he say to his apostles? Go, right? Go forth into the whole world, proclaiming the good news, teaching all that I have taught you and baptizing, drawing people to the liturgy so that salvation can be applied to all of these souls. And all of us who are confirmed, baptized and confirmed, have a part to play in this. Like we're all sent in our confirmation to be witnesses, soldiers for Christ. So that has to happen first to draw people to the liturgy. So the liturgy is first in importance in the church's life, but not necessarily first in kind of the chronological order of how things happen. It's the point that's being made here. Uh, let's jump over to paragraph 10. So the point has just been made that the liturgy is not, does not exhaust the activity of the church. The council then says in 10, nevertheless, the liturgy is the summit towards which the activity of the church is directed. And at the same time, it is the font from which all her power flows. This is the place where we draw this teaching that the liturgy is the source and summit of the Christian life. The word font here is being used in place of source, kind of used interchangeably as synonyms. So it's the, the, the high point. Everything we do is meant to be drawn up into the worship of God in the liturgy. And from the worship of God, we're meant to draw strength and grace to continue to be his disciples and apostles in the world. It's the, the source and the summit. 
of our whole Christian life. For the aim and object of apostolic works, apostolic works are all those things we do in the world on behalf of Christ, right? the teaching and the works of charity. The aim and object of apostolic works is that all who are made sons of God by faith and baptism should come together to praise God in the midst of his church, to take part in the sacrifice, and to eat the Lord's Supper. That's the goal. The goal of everything that we do as Catholics is ourselves and to draw others to the source and summit of our faith. A great example of this is uh, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa and her sisters, who continue her work in the world today, are not mere social workers. Right? They do all kinds of wonderful acts of, of charity to alleviate the suffering of the poorest of the poor. But their ultimate goal is not just to make earthly life easier for these people. It's to draw those they serve to Christ. And so Mother Teresa, before she did anything else, spent literally hours before the Blessed Sacrament in the chapel in the morning for Mass and adoration before she went about her work for the day. Because the Eucharist was the source and summit of everything she did. That's what it means to truly live this call to apostolic work in the church. Father? Wow. Yes? In, that, in paragraph 10, where it says, and you're saying that liturgy is the source and summit, mm -hmm. that it seems to me that's referring to the liturgy, the mass liturgy, not the other definition, or the other parts of the liturgy that you mentioned. It's, I've never heard anybody say the the uh, divine office is the source and summit. So is this more about the mass or all the liturgy, the public minute liturgies that you mentioned? Yeah, I would say primarily it's about the mass because the mass itself really is the um, the the summit of the whole liturgical life of the church. But all the other aspects of the liturgical life of the church are oriented in some way or another to the mass. Um, so like. You know, baptism. The word font can bring to mind baptism, certainly. Um, the catechism, one of the ways it describes baptism is it's, a, it's the, the, the washing to prepare us to eat the supper of the Lord. So the liturgy of the hours is meant to be kind of an extension of the worship of the Mass throughout the day, for example. So it can kind of apply to both, but yes, I think there is a primacy to the reference to the Mass and the Eucharist. Thank you. Any other questions? So far? Yes. Father, excuse me. About the font, the word font, you said it's the source and then also water? Yeah, so source and font are used as synonyms here. Okay. Um, if you think about, like, maybe an image like the, where is the source of the Mississippi River, right? Okay. Somewhere up in Minnesota, right? The river begins. Mm -hmm. So it's that idea of kind of the, the beginning and the end. Okay, thank you. All right, let's look at uh, paragraph 11. In order that the liturgy may be able to produce its full effects, it is necessary that the faithful come to it with proper dispositions, that their minds should be attuned to their voices, and that they should cooperate with divine grace, lest they receive it in vain. So we're going to see in a moment that one of the key principles for reform is what the fathers of the Second Vatican Council call fully conscious and active participation. This is what they're alluding to here. Because the liturgy in and of itself is objectively the source and summit of Christian life. And everything we need, all the grace of salvation, is offered to us through the liturgy. But it also requires our free response and our collaboration or cooperation. We have to receive the gift, right? And if we're not properly disposed, we can't receive the gift. And so we are called to so attune our minds and our hearts and our voices to the what's happening in the liturgy so that God's grace will be effective in us and not be received in vain. Pastors of souls must therefore realize that when the liturgy is celebrated, something more is required than the mere observation of the laws governing valid and licit celebration. It is their duty also to ensure that the faithful take part fully aware of what they are doing, 
actively engaged in the rite, and enriched by its effects. So, there is liturgical law that establishes what is to be said and done in the liturgy, particularly by the minister. Right? It's important to follow the liturgical law. It's not something that is just unimportant to be attentive to, but the point being made here is that that's not the only obligation of pastors of souls, the ministers of the sacraments. We also have a duty to help people be properly disposed to then benefit from the liturgy celebrated according to the laws that the church has established. Okay? So again, this you're going to see later then this call to instruction to the teaching of the people about the liturgy so that they can come properly disposed to receive the graces offered there. Okay, paragraph 12. The spiritual life, however, is not limited solely to participation in the liturgy. The Christian is indeed called to pray with his brethren, but he must also enter into his chamber to pray to the Father in secret. Yet more, according to the teaching of the Apostle, he should pray without ceasing. We learn from the same Apostle, so this is St. Paul, that we must always bear about in our body the dying of Jesus, so that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodily frame. This is why we ask the Lord in the sacrifice of the Mass that receiving the offering of the spiritual victim, he may fashion us for himself as an eternal gift. So here we come back to this point that the liturgy is the highest work of the church, but it's not the only work. And we are called also to a, a, a private life prayer, kind of between those moments of encountering the Lord in the liturgy, we're called to pray always and to pray to our Father in secret. So an invitation to meditation, contemplation, and a deep life of prayer outside of those moments in which we encounter the Lord in the liturgy. Why do you suppose they just said Apostle instead of St. Paul? That's a, tr traditionally kind of a, a, a title for St. Paul is the we're kind of capitalized word Apostle. And I don't know why they chose to do it that way, but... He really wasn't yeah. an Apostle. If you read um, St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa, he often refers to the Apostle, and that's Paul. It's like John. He also says the philosopher. That's Aristotle. He's got these kind of titles. John so never used his name when he was writing stuff. What's that? John never used his name when he was writing things. Uh, no, I suppose he didn't. But but Paul himself well, says, okay. "I've been chosen as an apostle." Right? He kind of at one point even defends his status as an apostle uh, in his writings. Number uh, 13, popular devotions of the Christian people are to be highly commended, provided they accord with the laws and norms of the church, above all when they are ordered by the apostolic seat. So popular devotions refers to things like the rosary, the stations of the cross, uh, devotions to Our Lady of Perpetual Help, um, litanies, chaplets, all of these things they're not formally part of the church's liturgy, they're, but they're called popular devotions. Popular, not necessarily in the sense that they're, you know, like everyone's doing them, although many people are, but popular is kind of the, the devotion of the people, the popular devotions. So the Second Vatican Council did not do away with devotion, the devotional life of the church. Sometimes that's falsely claimed, not so much in our day, but in the past it had been. The Second Vatican Council just said these should be in accord, attuned to kind of in um, communion with the liturgy. So, for example, uh, one of the practices that many people perhaps remember was um, going to Mass and people would pray the rosary while the priest was celebrating Mass, right? That's something that the fathers of the council wanted to reform, right? So that people would be attuning their minds and their hearts to what's happening in the Mass and the words and the prayers of the Mass rather than praying a popular devotion during the liturgy. But by that, they weren't saying, get rid of your rosary. Right? If there's a time and a place for these in the Christian life. So they encouraged popular devotion. Um, but that, So it's in the next paragraph, uh, just after this, or two paragraphs down, where... They say these devotions should be drawn up so that they harmonize with the liturgical seasons, accord with the liturgy, and in some fashion are derived from it, and lead people to it, since in fact the liturgy, by its very nature, far surpasses any of them. 
All right. So um, that is, again, kind of this overarching understanding of the liturgy from which now the Second Vatican Council can propose certain reforms. And the primary reform, the primary lens through which all of this is going to be viewed is this next section, section two on page five, the promotion of liturgical instruction and active participation. Okay, so paragraph 14. Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. Why is it demanded? Again, because for God's grace to be fruitful, we have to be properly disposed. And this fully conscious and active participation is how we are disposed to receive fruitfully the grace of God. Conscious is a key word here, right? Which does, doesn't just mean you should be awake. <laughs> you come to mass. It does mean that. But conscious is a reference to the fact that we are intelligent beings, right? God created us with an intellect and a free will so that we have to choose freely to unite our mind and our heart to what is happening in the liturgy. Such participation by the Christian people as a chosen race a royal priesthood, so there's that reference to the common priesthood of all the baptized, a holy nation, a redeemed people, is their right and duty by reason of their baptism. A right and a duty that is ours because of our baptism is that we participate in the liturgy. In the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before all else, for it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful are to derive the true Christian spirit. And therefore, pastors of souls must zealously strive to achieve it by means of the necessary instruction in all their pastoral work. It's very important to understand what the church means by this full and active participation. Because sometimes it's falsely understood to mean that all kinds of people should be doing all kinds of things in the sanctuary, right? That has happened more since the Second Vatican Council, where particularly lay people are involved more in reading the readings and serving at the altar and extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion and maybe more involvement in the music and whatnot of the Mass. Um, but right at the beginning of paragraph 14, we were told all the faithful should be led to this kind of participation. Well, when we have Mass on Sunday morning, all the faithful cannot be up in the sanctuary doing something, right? So the fathers are speaking not primarily about that. They're speaking about this call to engage mind and heart along with our body and our voice in the worship of God in the Mass. This is what they mean by full and active participation, that we're consciously uniting ourselves to what is happening in the sanctuary. And this is going to be, they said, the aim to be considered before all else. And so the reforms that the Second Vatican Council is envisioning is meant to facilitate this kind of participation in the church's liturgy, and especially in the Mass. Flip over to page 6. So, how is this going to happen? How are we going to in invite people and bring about a fuller and more active and conscious participation? Paragraph 19. With zeal and patience, Pastors of souls must promote the liturgical instruction of the faithful and also their active participation in the liturgy, both internally and externally, taking into account their age and condition, their way of life and standard of religious culture. By doing so, pastors will be fulfilling one of the chief duties of a faithful dispenser of the mysteries of God. And in this matter, they must lead their flock not only in word, but also by example. So the council is calling for instruction, right? The teaching of people so that they understand more perfectly what the liturgy is and what we're about when we offer our worship to God in the liturgy. 
and also then teaching the people how to participate internally and externally. So this union of body and soul, right? As human beings, we are body, soul, composites. So to participate in the Mass means certain things about our internal life, our mind, our, what I'm thinking about, what I'm desiring interiorly when I go to Mass, and externally, sitting, standing, kneeling, singing, praying, speaking, offering the responses. What we do externally with our voice and our body is meant to be a manifestation of what's going on in the heart and in the mind, internally. This union of internal and external participation in the Mass. This is the goal. Okay, paragraph uh, 21. Now we're going to get a little more specific about reforms of the sacred liturgy. If you look, I'm going to start at the second sentence in paragraph 21. For the liturgy is made up of immutable elements divinely instituted and of elements subject to change. These not only may but ought to be changed with the passage of time if they have suffered from the intrusion of anything out of harmony with the inner nature of the liturgy or have become unsuited to it. Um, we saw this a bit last week, this idea that certain things are subject to change and certain aren't, right? based on what we believe Christ has instituted. So we can change the language we use to pray the Mass, but we can't substitute pizza and beer for the bread and wine. Okay? Uh, this is the whole baby in the bathwater thing, right? The Council was calling for the throwing out of the bathwater, those things that for whatever reason over time had led the... Um, liturgy to kind of suffer from a kind of intrusion, something out of harmony with the nature of the liturgy. But we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? There are certain things that are divinely instituted, and we can't just, in the name of reform, wholesale get rid of everything and start afresh. We have to save the baby when we throw out the bathwater. No problem. Yes. So, with respect to that, is that making those changes, is that country by country? Or for example, we added, you know, through my fault, through my fault, and that was being done in other parts of the world for many years before we did it. So, was the, why was the United States out of sync with the rest of the world? I'm glad you asked. If you look at paragraph 22, <laughs> the council explains who has the authority to make these changes. So, number one, it depends solely on the authority of the church that is the apostolic see. So that is the Pope, essentially, and the Roman congregations that serve him at the Vatican. And as laws may determine on the bishop. So each bishop has, there are certain things that each bishop can determine for his own diocese. Number two, speaks to, it makes reference to competent territorial bodies of bishops. So that would be for us the United States Council of Catholic Bishops, the USCCB. So the Pope, the individual bishop, and the bishop's conference, there are different aspects of the liturgy that these different uh, players in the church have a certain authority over. Okay, so certain things that may have been done in other parts of the world that weren't being done in the U.S. probably was something that was up to the Council of Bishops. And one country may have chosen to do it this way and another this way. Um, the reception of Holy Communion on the hand, for example, was determined by was sought permission for that our conference to Rome and was given permission, but not every council of bishops asked for that for their people, for example. Number three is interesting. Therefore, no other person, even if he be a priest, may add, remove, or change anything in the liturgy on his own authority. Uh, this has not always been followed very well, right, throughout the history since the Second Vatican Council. Um, but the, it's pretty strongly worded here, right? That we're not to just on our own whim change the words and the actions of the liturgy. It's been determined to be celebrated in a particular way by the Pope and the bishops of the church. And if we start just introducing our own changes because we think we know better, we're, we're going to begin to distort the nature of the liturgy. And we're going to cause a certain amount of confusion about what the liturgy is and what the liturgy is not. Uh, All right. Yes? So some parishes I know ours is not, but what about the parishes who use 
children's literacy for particular math reading. Is that a no-no then? There is a... Bob, um, can you, can you oh, the question was... You're talking about the lectionary, right? Yeah. The parishes that would use a children's lectionary for like their school masses, for example. There is a, um, a, a children's lectionary that translates the readings, uh, desiring to make it more accessible to children. And I'm not certain, so I know that that was, um, a permission was given for the use of that. It's called an indult, where the congregation in Rome gave permission for that to be used in certain circumstances. And to be honest, I'm not sure if that indult still exists or not. Uh, but some of these indults were kind of given for a period of time and expire and are not renewed. But people don't necessarily know that they've expired and not renewed. And I'd have to confirm whether or not that indult is still in place. But another example of the, an indult was um, if you were an extraordinary minister for some period of time, you may remember a time when extraordinary ministers purified the vessels. That, there was an indult, a permission given for that from Rome, but at a certain point in time, I think it was within the last maybe 15 years or so, 10 or 15 years, that indult was not renewed. And so now only a, a ordained minister or an instituted acolyte is supposed to purify the vessels. That's another example of an indult. Yes? Father, for priests who add or change or delete, at what point does the Mass become not valid? Well, the validity of the Mass really concerns uh, just the essentials of bread, wine, and the words of institution. Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body. So, as, oh, sorry, the question was, at what point, if a priest changes elements of the Mass, does it become invalid? And so for that to happen, it would have to be either some sort of defect in the matter, which would be the bread and the wine, so using something that's not valid matter, or failing to use the proper form, which are the words spoken, which are the words of Christ, to institute the Eucharist at the Last Supper. Outside of that, we would say a Mass is not invalid, but it is illicit, which is, you're not following the proper liturgical laws, but it's still a valid Mass. And it's still the Eucharist. You're still receiving Jesus in Holy Communion. And is that a problem for people who are receiving, or only a problem for the priest? Um, I mean, should it be a matter of concern for us as the congregations or not? Uh, not so much. I mean, it, you, would, you could rightly be concerned that yeah. the priest is not following the, the liturgical laws. But, I mean, there's no um, reason you should be concerned for your own fruitful participation in the Mass necessarily. But that can negatively affect people's participation in the Mass, right? And the fruitfulness of it. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to decide what to pick and choose and what to pass over here. Um, 23, at the very end where it says, finally, there must be no innovations unless the good of the church genuinely and certainly requires them. And care must be taken that any new forms adopted should in some way grow organically from forms already existing. Uh, this particular idea of this organic development and growth of the liturgy is the cause for some uh, conversation and debate uh, among liturgical experts in the church. Um, some are rather critical about the ways that, practically speaking, the reforms happened after this document because it was rather quick and sudden and stark some of the changes that were made. So some will, will make the claim that changes may have been called for but perhaps weren't instituted in a very organic way and caused a certain kind of sense of rupture uh, among the, the Christian people. And interestingly, um, Pope Benedict in 2000, I think it was 2007 or 2008, um, you may remember this, he issued a document that basically gave permission for the, the old Latin Mass to be celebrated by priests throughout the world. There are certain kind of conditions and guidelines for that, but many liturgical scholars believed that what Pope Benedict was trying to do 
was to create the possibility for some kind of more organic um, development of the liturgical reform so that kind of the, the, the what's called the ordinary form now of the Mass that we're familiar with, that we celebrate every day in church, would kind of coexist in a way with what's called the extraordinary form, which is how the Mass was celebrated before the Council, so that there could be perhaps kind of a, a give and take and kind of eventually a, a more kind of full and organic development of the liturgy. That, I don't know if I'm explaining that all that well, but that makes sense. So um, there are places in St. Louis where you can, St. Francis de Sales, for example, um, where you can attend the old Latin Mass, and that's perfectly legitimate and uh, licit, and um, many people find that fruitful and helpful for them. Um, little kind of opportunity for you here at our parish, actually, on the Feast of St. Gerard, October 16th, there's a group in St. Louis called Una Voce, that their, their kind of mission is to promote the traditional Latin Mass, and so they have celebrations of it in different places and different times, and they asked me if we would host a, a Mass, a Latin Mass, on the Feast of St. Gerard this year, so they're going to have Mass at 6.30 p.m. on Friday, October 16th in our church. If you're interested, you're welcome to attend. It will be the, the traditional Mass, we call the Extraordinary Form, so They'll be all in Latin except the homily. I'll be preaching in English. <laughs> but um, that's going to take place on October 16th. So if you're interested just even to kind of come and see what were things like before this and what are things like now, that would be an opportunity for you to do so. Uh, yes? Can you do that mass? Can you back to Actually, so I'm going to preach, but I'm not celebrating. Father Keller is celebrating mass. He's the pastor of Assumption in South right. County. But yes, it will be celebrated ad orientem, so he will be facing towards the tabernacle and using the front of the altar. Yeah, so, are the priests trained for this, or is it a special, you know, practice that they have to go and learn it? Um, it's, it's not taught. I, not necessarily. The question was, do the priests, are the priests just kind of automatically trained this in the seminary, taught this in the seminary? And no, I think that they can, if they're interested, they can ask to be trained in it, but it's not part of every priest's work. Yes? What about uh, the way we used to receive communion? Now, receiving it on the mouth, is that the way it's going to be done too? Yes, so I think, I'm not certain of this, I'm trying to get some details from them about what we need to do to set up, but I think what they'll probably do is just have us set up some kneelers at the front where people will kneel and receive communion, as you would have. Uh, in this, so that's, the, that's the way the communion is received in the extraordinary form. Of the so I think they're going to have kneelers at the front where you'll kneel and receive it. What about the crucifix? Um, will, will it be brought closer? Or? For that mass, the crucifix will be where it is. We're not going to renovate the sanctuary. <laughs> 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 Did you have a question? No. What about people who can't kneel anymore? Well, I think you could. I'm, I'm sure they would accommodate your standing. <laughs> <laughs> or they'll help you down enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, paragraph 24. I'm not going to read it, but it's it's basically one of the um, one of the characteristics you see in the Second Vatican Council was this desire for a kind of biblical revival in the Catholic Church. So this paragraph speaks to the importance of sacred scripture, specifically in the liturgy, and points out that so much of the liturgy, not just the readings but the prayers of the people and the priest at the Mass are drawn from sacred scripture. And so, you know, oftentimes Catholics are kind of criticized for being ignorant of scripture. Um, maybe in, in some ways we are and not being able to quote script, chapter and verse as well as many of our Protestant brothers and sisters. But the whole liturgy of the church is just soaked in sacred scripture. It all flows from scripture. And uh, we're formed in it from childhood as Catholics when we attend Mass in the prayers and the readings of the scriptures. All right, it's 10 o'clock, so we're going to um, break here, and we'll just pick up from here next week and then work our way into the next section. We got through the meat of it today. There's a few more things I'll highlight next time. So we'll pick up at paragraph 24 and then work our way into chapters 2 and 3 in two weeks. Next week we won't be. So two weeks. Thanks everyone.